you very much. Good afternoon. Thank you very much for inviting me. I'm very honored to be here. This is a wonderful event. And thank you for coming, Mr. Ambassador. Thank you, Gideon, for inviting me. And special thanks go to Diana and Stevie for organizing everything. I got about five emails every day telling me where to be, at what time, and uh, what to do. So I made it here. Uh, does everybody hear me? Or should I use the handphone, or do you hear me like this as well? OK. OK. I will try to do my best with both hands. <laughs> um, it's not easy to give this talk today. Uh, not only because of this extraordinary occasion, and Liz already mentioned that I myself am born in London and my parents were refugees. But I don't want to talk about myself. Um, it's also difficult because I was told, and I see in the audience, that there are very many different people, people who have experienced this past themselves and people who learn about it people who are academics and people who are far away from academia. And so it's obvious I will not be able to please everybody. That doesn't work. But I will try uh, my very best. So uh, let me start and tell you what I would like to talk about today. First, I will mention and elaborate a bit what Liz has already started to do. Uh, and thank you for this wonderful introduction. Uh, I will talk about the salience of language for memory and for narrating the past. And in this way, I link to what Adam Kaufman has said at lunch. Uh, the witnesses are, as we know, uh, dying. There are not many more alive. And we need their memories. We need their narratives to be able to remember and to know what happened. We need to convey and talk about these narratives. And this is why the second generation is so very important, because we as the children know what our parents have experienced. Or we might not know. And this is what I will also talk about. I will briefly talk about the Austrian context, because my study is situated in Austria, but I think one can generalize from this study. Uh, and here I can link to Gideon, because you already mentioned Heldenplatz, and I will also talk about this very famous square in Austria. I will then talk about a very specific group uh, in Vienna, th which we call the Kinderjause, the sort of children's party, uh, which is a label for the second generation of refugees who were in the resistance, who were socialists and communists, uh, who were able to flee, or who were imprisoned and deported, who were fought in the armies of the Allied forces and who decided to return, to return to a country of perpetrators. Uh, it's very difficult to imagine what that means, uh, to come back to a country where they didn't want you, and where they would have killed you, or where they did all kinds of terrible things to you, which I will also briefly mention. And we interviewed uh, a sample out of these children, second generation. Children is the wrong word. They're my age, uh, which you could guess, probably. Uh, and uh, about what their parents had told them, and how one talks about the past or doesn't talk. Uh, and specifically in Austria, but also elsewhere, what we encounter is a narrative veil, a veil of vagueness and silence. Uh, which is only slowly being lifted. And finally, I will raise the question, can we learn something from the past? Which is, I think, a very important question to discuss. So let me start with two quotes which I think are very 
important quotes about uh, language and discourse and the relationship uh, to memory and remembering. One is by Reinhard Koselleck, one of a conceptual historian, uh, who's, who said, uh, even if language may at times have been only a secondary factor in the process of action and suffering, as soon as an event becomes part of the past, language becomes the primary factor without which no memory and no scientific transposition of this memory is possible. So we depend on language, on language in a very broad sense. It's also signs, it's films, it's photographs, it's various symbols which make meaning. And the second uh, quote which I like very much is by Wittgenstein who said or wrote, the limits of my language mean the limits of my world, which means whatever we don't talk about doesn't really exist. So we have to talk. And uh, I would like to start briefly, not by giving you now a history lesson into Austrian and European history, but just to mention a few, I think, very important dates, uh, like the takeover of the Nazi party in Germany in 1933. Uh, then the Nuremberg laws, which actually implemented the legislation uh, to exclude Jews first from professions, then from the spaces, park benches, then from shopping, and so forth and so on. Institutionalized exclusion which, as we know, uh, then ends in deportation and extermination. The Spanish Civil War, uh, in this context, I think is very important, not only because some of uh, the people I will be talking about also fought in the Spanish Civil War, uh, but because it already showed what is possible and what happens when fascism takes over. <coughs> then the so-called Anschluss of Austria to the German Reich on 11th and 12th March 1938, and the November pogroms, I don't like the word Kristallnacht because that is a Nazi label. It is, we call it November pogrom. In November, 9th of November 1938, the destruction of synagogues in Austria and Germany. And then finally, the beginning of World War I, of course, uh, two, sorry, uh, D-Day, and the day which we commemorate with Holocaust Memorial Day, the liberation of Auschwitz-Birkenau through the Soviet army in, on 27th of January, 1945. This is, stands metonymically for the liberation of Europe in that time. And I just noted Vienna was liberated on the 13th of April. And finally, end of World War II, 8th of May 1945. And now we are commemorating 75 years liberation of the concentration camp, but basically of fascism and national socialism. So I'm coming back to Heldenplatz, which Gideon already mentioned, and the balcony, which you see here, uh, where Hitler is standing, uh, and the masses of Viennese welcoming Hitler, and uh, the swastika flag. And of, it's also important to show one of the many horrific pictures of the Viennese Jews who were forced to wash and brush the streets with toothbrushes and were humiliated, tortured by the Gestapo and by the SA in Vienna. Uh, by the way, the, the anti-Semitism was much more radical in Vienna than in Berlin, for example. Uh, and there's a, there was a lot of reporting that the anti-Semitism was so much uh, 
more brutal in those first days in Austria than in uh, Germany. Uh, what is most notable here are the laughing and cheering bystanders. And in this way, I would like to come back uh, to the very impressive talk by, I don't know where he is now, the, uh, from the, the member of the student union, who mentioned the bystanders. Uh, the people who did nothing against it, but just watched. Watched, some of them cheered, applauded, uh, thought that was great fun. And uh, the bystanders actually let it happen, which is why, and this is the motto, as I understand, of our coming together here today, is we need to stand together and speak up. So I would like to talk about what I call the voices from the past of the children of those who returned. Uh, why is voice so important? And in this way, I come back to language and the way language conveys memories via narratives, via stories, the stories which are conveyed in families, but also publicly, which are documented. Spielberg, for example, the archive, but in Austria, there's also a big archive in the DERF, in the Dokumentation. Archiv Österreichischen Widerstands and archives here were also mentioned. We have photographs, films, we will still see a film today. Uh, the voice, as Wachtin has said, is the speaking personality, the speaking consciousness. A voice always has a will or desire behind it, its own timbre and overtones. So we need to let people speak, and we need to listen to people. We need to give them space to tell their stories. Uh, frequently, of course, these stories are used in very naive ways, also by the media. They're shortened, they're instrumentalized by politicians. Uh, however, as an academic, I think we can uh, give the stories the space they actually deserve. So what we did in this team, we had an interdisciplinary team, uh, one historian, Helene Meyman, one psychiatrist and sociopsychologist, therapist, Ernst Berger, and myself uh, as a linguist who did this project together. Why this interdisciplinary team? In my view, you can only actually investigate and analyze such complex issues in such a interdisciplinary way. There's no way just one entry point would be sufficient. And we looked at this group uh, of children, uh, of the people who came back, the so-called Kinderjause. Uh, basically, the Kinderjause are about 200. Uh, people between the age of 65 and 75, 80. Uh, and uh, our objectives and aims were, first of all, to know about the historical context of their parents' lives, some of which is documented, but some of it not. Uh, to gather photographs, to make sort of a documentation. The second big issue was to know what the impact of the parents' biography has on the children's life. What is the impact of the first generation on the second generation? And then we also interviewed some of the children of the children, so the third generation. And so just to give you already a, one of the results, the third generation knows much more about their grandparents than the children do. <laughs> because the third generation, the grandchildren, came and come and ask. And the grandparents are happy to tell their stories. Uh, whereas the children, this is much more difficult. And they were children in a time where the survival day-to-day -day, uh, was really important. <laughs> 
We also wanted to know if the value systems of the parents had an impact on the children's lives. The parents who came back to build up a better Austria, to prevent it ever happening again. So the never again was at the forefront and had a vision of a very different democratic uh, state. And how, does that, how was that conveyed? Uh, the mission and the social responsibility. And I can already tell you that most of the uh, people we interviewed have not become politicians, but they have become academics, social workers, authors, writers, architects, uh, many, many all socially oriented professions. And I don't think that that is coincidence. And then we also looked at differences across gender and so forth, which I will have to neglect uh, today. So where did these people, where did the parents have to go? And you see they started out in Austria. Some of them fled into the Soviet Union and barely then escaped again. Uh, some were obviously deported to the camps, to Auschwitz, and survived. Some uh, were in France and also uh, in the Spanish Civil War. And some were happy enough to make it to the UK and some to the US. Some also to Chile and South America. So basically, uh, this group was spread out, and some of them, and as you will see now, we interviewed a total of 29 people uh, with both long, semi-structured and in-depth interviews. Uh, 20 of them were Jewish, uh, some were in exile, 15 were imprisoned, and also active in the resistance. And we interviewed uh, 11 of the grandchildren, and we interviewed some of the people twice, and also in-depth interviews. So as you can imagine, there's a lot of material. I don't want to go into this in detail. Uh, happy to answer questions afterwards. So why look at the narratives? And as I already said, that's the entry point we have as second and other generations is via the stories. The stories which are transmitted, conveyed, told to us at various occasions. And what we then did, and now I come to my more linguistic part, uh, we found out that there is a whole typology of stories, different stories told at different occasions. There are generic narratives, which are stories told always again and again and again, and which are metonymic. They condense a lot of experiences in one story. And I will give you an example, the story about how evil uh, and sadistic the SS was. There are scenic narratives. These were most interesting because each of our interviewees, both female and male, uh, very rational people, very well educated, at one point started to cry. And always at the same point, and always told us the same story, and always actually almost in the same words. And uh, we hadn't expected that. Uh, and I call this in German Tränengeschichte. Uh, it, to translate that into English would be sort of the tear story or the very emotional story. The story which condenses the entire suffering of the parents and the identification with that suffering. And then we have stories which are passed on stories which are full of humor because the parents want to create distance and tell their children the funny side of it, and the family remembrance stories which are told over and over again. 
So I want to start out with one of the narratives by Gisela. Gisela was in the resistance. She was a communist. Uh, she was one of the so-called medals, uh, which were young women who tried to talk to the Wehrmacht soldiers in Belgium and try to persuade them to not do anything to victims. Uh, and uh, she was then imprisoned, uh, deported to Germany, tortured, survived, and came back to Vienna. And this is one of the stories which she told when she came back uh, and explains why victims remained silent. So she says, my surroundings consisted of people who had been persecuted. The few acquaintances from earlier time that I met, they all emphasized that they had not done anything and were not Nazis, so suddenly there were no Nazis. Uh, once I went to see our old tenement house and our old caretaker embraced me cheerily. How nice that you are back. She complained that her husband, of whom I knew that he was a Nazi, had to do work cleaning up rubble. On the side of the house it still said Steinmetz, that's her uh, last name, so you'd, so swine, yeah? To my question, if she had not had time to wash that off, she said, oh, I swear to you, I'd never seen that. That was my first and last visit to that house. So that is something which happened, the denial, they, no, nobody had seen anything, nobody knew anything, they had all helped at what time, and also the obvious naivete uh, of thinking that she would not know uh, that her husband had been a Nazi and that she had obviously must have seen uh, this graffiti. And many people never went back to the places where they had lived. And obviously it was very difficult to get something back. Everything was stolen, not only Klimt. Uh, many, not many people had Klimt. Uh, basically, most, most uh, Jews of Indiana, uh, which had been 200,000 before the war and 60,000 had been murdered, but most Jews were very poor or bürgerlich, bourgeois, and uh, it was very late that restitution finally happened. So many people, many survivors didn't talk and partly because they had such experiences, partly because people were not interested in hearing their stories. Actually, they made everybody feel guilty and you didn't want to feel guilty, so it was better uh, not to listen to them and also because they had to survive from day to day, build up a new life after coming back from concentration camps, prisons, exile, etc. So when we interviewed uh, the second generation, they said things like, keeping silent is not the right expression, but telling a lot neither. No longer to be able to tell the difference between one's own memory and what you've heard and read. So it kind of gets blurred, what you know. Our parents started very, very late to tell anything. So they wanted to spare and protect the children as well. Or it was talked about a lot. With my father, that was very strong. He always presented it to us as if it was all adventures. And that was incredibly funny. So a way to cope with it and to make it accessible uh, for the children. And one of those narratives which shows how vague these stories were and what we actually came to see was there were no indications of time. There was only an indication of space. So the Bakhtinian chronotopes where you have sort of a cognitive uh, knowledge of time and space vanish. You go from here to there but you don't know when. 
And so, for example, this uh, woman uh, tells us, and then he was for a year with the Gestapo at Mittersteig, was the Gestapo prison in Vienna. They were at Mittersteig there at first. You don't know when. And then, when? At Marzinplatz, <coughs> other prison, I think too. There is a sort of heirloom I have. Well, there he was, so to speak, hedging vagueness, sitting in prison and nothing to do. And there he somehow managed to organize for himself or request a German-English dictionary, a Langenscheid. And there is the address imprinted. She has this dictionary. And then, again, we don't know when, he learned English. Well, you cannot learn English with a dictionary, but he kept himself busy with it. And well, then he went to Germany into one of those prisons. Of course, he was deported. He didn't go. Yeah? But that is the way this was transported. There are no perpetrators. There are no agents. They just go from place to place. And we don't know when. So when we did a quantitative analysis and we looked at were times and space really talked about in any concrete way, we saw that the elements which indicate time stopped here, then rose here again. And that is interesting because that was the time the Hitler-Stalin pact came up. And a lot was talked about that. And then there was nothing. Time stood still. And then after 44, and that is, of course, then D-Day and slowly the victory, liberation, people, the stories, again, contain space and time. So uh, there's a lot of possible interpretations which we can talk about. But basically, it is about day-to-day -day survival. You don't know, and you have no vision, really, of time, except when will the war end. And then you live again. You start living a more normal life. I said I would tell you one of the generic stories for <coughs> that condense the evil of the <coughs> concentration uh, camp guards. And that was, we heard that story again and again. It was retold. And it's probably the story, again, which metonymically conveys the horror and how you couldn't, the, the total lose-lose situation. And so uh, this uh, Male interviewee says, there was a barbed wire, and one wasn't allowed to step over it. Anyone who stepped over it was shot dead. There was an inmate, and an SS guard pushes the inmate's hat off his head, and it flies over the fence, and he tells him to go get it. The inmate said, I'm not getting that. Then I will shoot you for refusing an order. So the inmate steps over the fence, and the SS guard says, now I will shoot you for breaking the rules. So double bind. Anything you do, you will be shot. Uh, and then, then this interviewee says, that is something that really impressed itself on me as a child. And that was the one story we heard again and again, basically encompassing many, many, of course, other horrible experiences. And finally, what I already introduced, the Tränengeschichte, the tear story, the emotional story, were the, those very rational and educated uh, second generation male and female interviewees sort of identified most with their parents. I call this the Daniel Waltz uh, story. That's my label. Um, uh, and I would like to uh, now read that to you. When the Soviet troops came, and I already said the Soviets liberated Vienna, uh, 
And of course, they took over one house after another, so to speak. They went from apartment to apartment looking for Nazis who were hiding. They, of course, were constantly, and now this day is the people living in this apartment, his parents, who he's talking about, were constantly thinking of Goldschmidt. They went into the apartment of the building's owner, the housewife, who was somewhere in the countryside to be safe. She wasn't there. My grandfather was the janitor. He had the keys. He unlocked it for us. There was a piano inside. The whole building didn't have anything like it. So you must imagine the Russian, the Soviet officer, taking those, this people who had survived into the apartment. And then the Russian officer, who was obviously an educated man, he said, well, the liberated need to show up now. He wanted someone to play the Blue Danube waltz. But no one could play the piano. Then he said, that cannot be in Vienna. Everyone plays the piano. This is the city of music. Then someone said, well, there is someone who can play the piano. That's Goldschmidt. Then they brought Goldschmidt from the cellar, and he played the Blue Danube waltz. Now, what this story is telling us is that Goldschmidt was the, the Jew in this building, and he was hidden by this family throughout World War II in the cellar, and he was brought up from the darkness into the light at this moment when the Soviet officer wanted to listen to the Danube waltz. And nobody else could play it, so they needed Mr. Goldschmidt. And when uh, this interviewee tells this story, he starts crying. He told us this story three times, and every time he started crying. And he's a very well-educated professor and a highly esteemed academic. So for him, that was the story of how liberation happened, how from darkness you come to light, and how his parents had survived and hidden this Jew uh, in the cellar. His parents were non-Jewish, but communists. So to conclude, uh, I would like to just summarize some of the results of our, this study, which I think might also be important for other studies of not similar, because there is nothing similar, but of uh, other people who were imprisoned or who sort of uh, refugees who ha all have their very specific stories. One of the conclusions is the enormous resilience of this generation. And uh, I'm full of admiration of seeing some of the Kindertransport children here, some of you who have experienced this horrible, horrible, atrocious time, and the enormous resilience which we came across in, in interviewing this generation, and for us, the children, is an enormous responsibility, but also role model. The loss of time when you want to survive, and how only location became the way to organize and orient yourself. The transmission of the values, all these second generation have this enormous and feel the responsibility of the never again. And to confront silence and how important it is to speak up and to uh, realize and uh, to utter your experience in words, in signs, in images, in films, in photos. However, because otherwise there is nothing to remember. And the scenic stories obviously allow entry points for therapists also. The way to find out the trauma is probably through those scenic stories. And we've talked with uh, 
uh, psychotherapists about that. So learning from the past. Yes, we can learn from the past, I think, uh, with listening and hearing about the unique and collective experiences of persecution and flight. Uh, the analysis of narratives offer insight and listening to refugee stories opens the doors or maybe the windows uh, to their experiences and we learn to understand. Also, giving refugees the time and space needed to remember uh, is very important. Uh, and not to just bureaucratically deal with them in some way. They need time and we need time. And giving ref voice to refugees in the media also challenges routines of production practices. But I think it's very important again to give them the authenticity uh, to tell their stories. I want to come back to Helden Platz. Uh, in finishing my short lecture and I want to show you one of the survivors who actually also survived in England, as I said, like my parents. Uh, this is Susie Bock. Susie Bock will be 100 this year and I must tell you she was my oldest student. Uh, she came when she retired, she came to me to my office and said, I want to now do my PhD because she hadn't been able to study because she had to flee. And then she had to work and build up her new life. And now she wanted to study and she did. She did her master's, she did her PhD, she's written several books, she appears as a witness she goes to schools, and this year she will be 100. And here on Heldenplatz, and this is now Heldenplatz, uh, she, this year we heard her give a speech with 100, almost 100, talking to the young people and the people who were listening there and telling them, never forget. And uh, this is now. Heldenplatz. And civil society in Vienna has reappropriated Heldenplatz. It's now the, the square of celebration. Every May 8th, uh, we have the Feste Freude, the celebration of joy to celebrate the liberation of Vienna with Beethoven's Ninth Symphony and with speeches of the president, of the mayor of Vienna, the chancellor, etc. And it's a celebratory fest. So we have taken back this square, uh, which you, Gideon, has, have also talked about. And in this sense, I would like to end with never again and standing together everywhere. And this is a not very good image of the whole world. Thank you very much.